Okay, I'm just going to give you a bit of help with your homework T4. Uh, <clears throat> to do that, I didn't have any real data, so I had to create fake data. Uh, it's, you don't have to do this, uh, but anyway, I just you may be interested in how it's done. I just use uh, first thing we want to do is the calibration. So uh, these are the concentrations for our calibration samples. There's some true epsilon out there in the real world. We don't have access to that, but uh, we're assuming it's there. That's what we're trying to find. We have the width of our cuvette, one centimeter. <clears throat> so there's some true absorbance with our light. Uh, gets converted into some true transmittance. We're assuming this is uh, Beer's Law, where it's log 10 here because it's a solution. And then <clears throat> when you put your clear cuvette in there, there's some voltage that you read that's the maximum voltage. When you put your black cuvette in there, there's some voltage that you'd read that's the minimum voltage. Um, then from there, we can calculate what the true voltage should be and then add some noise and because we've added noise, we've also got to say that you know you can't go below the minimum or above the maximum. So all you have for data is the concentration of your calibration samples and whatever voltages you read when you stuck those into your spectrophotometer. So we need to convert voltages to transmittance. So we want transmittance that's going to equal your measured voltage, but we need to scale that because there's some minimum voltage that you read when uh, there's a black cuvette in there and then there's also a maximum. So to get this to scale from 0 to 100 percent we have to divide that difference by the span, V max minus V min. So that should be our transmittance and our absorbance would be negative log base 10 of the transmittance. So we know by Beer's Law, well we know that by Beer's Law, but we also know that uh, absorbance equals the cuvette width times the concentration times the uh, molar extinction coefficient, which is what we are after. We know the width, we know the concentrations, we want the molar extinction coefficient. So the best way to do that is to fit a line to the data. So I'm going to let's just I'll just show you what this data looks like right now. So we're going to plot concentration on the x-axis, axis and absorbance on the y. So we've got some sort of line. The slope of that line is going to be epsilon. So we need to fit to that line and I'm just going to use polyfit although on the code that you're gonna see that I'm gonna put in the, the share drive it's a lot more complicated I, I show you three different ways to do a linear fit and then one or two ways to do a linear fit and one way to do, do a nonlinear fit which actually gives you much better results but for the sake of time I'm just gonna use polyfit um, let's see on the x-axis is concentration, on the y is absorbance, and this is a first order polynomial. So it's going to spit out some constants. Actually, I think in the example code I called that P. So I'm going to run that. So it would help if I spelled that right. Polyfit. Ah, there. So now I've got these constants P1 and P2. P1 will be the slope, P2 will be the intercept. So that means our molar extinction coefficient is P1 divided by the width, which is 1 anyway, so it ends up being P1. Epsilon true is 10,000, so you can see we're not very off. Or, yeah, we're or 9,974 versus 10,000. So that would be our epsilon. So epsilon, let's call this epsilon 1, equals P1 divided by width, which is 1, so it's just P1. Anyway, but that is our molar extinction coefficient. 
Now I'm going to uh, do a batch experiment. I need to make fake batch data though. Okay, so this is my fake batch data. All I have to do is put in the initial concentrations, which we know. Uh, the initial concentration of A is 5 times 10 to the minus 5 molar. Initial concentration of B is 0 0.05 molar, much greater than the concentration of A, so we can assume that it's a pseudo first order reaction. We use so much B that B effectively doesn't change. And let's assume that the true rate constant is 1.5. That's what we're after, what we want to find out. So I start the simulation. You don't need to know how to do this. Just I end up with concentrations as a function of time and convert those to voltages just like I did in the calibration example. First thing we do is the same thing we did in the cal calibration example. In fact, I'm just going to come up here and copy the code copy both codes. So I'm going to find a transmittance and an absorbance, but I called this V sub M, so that's going to be V sub M. So now I have absorbance as a function of time, so if I plot time and absorbance, you get something like this. <clears throat> but we don't really no. Oh yeah, we, we know. So we started with knowing just the voltage as a function of time, converted it to transmittance, converted it to absorbance. Now we can uh, take that absorbance and use the epsilon that we found in the calibration portion and calculate concentration. So I'm going to call that CA measured equals absorbance divided by width, which is 1, divided by epsilon 1. So now I can plot T concentration and get an error because that's supposed to be CAM. There, there we go. So that's our concentration. Starts at five times ten to the minus five, drops down to zero. There's some noise there. Um, because there's noise in this data, uh, there's the chance that you might end up with a zero concentration. I just wrote a bit of code that will get us around that. You are probably not going to be in this position, but basically this is the code I pasted. All it says is find where the concentration of A is less than zero. Find the first place where that happens. And that'll be the last I that we want. And then we're going to use these, these variables T use, so the times we want to use and the concentrations we want to use. So if <clears throat> there is some place where the concentration goes below zero if it's not empty. Then uh, T use is going to just go from initial time to just before it hits concentration zero. That's the only; those are the only points that we're going to use. So now we want to do basically the same thing that we did with the concentration uh, because this is a pseudo first order reaction. It's uh, the rate equation becomes natural log of the concentration over the initial concentration it's got to equal negative the rate constant times time so if we plot that if we make a new y let's say y or well let's say x equals time time use the time we're going to use and y equals log that is the natural log of ca use divided by the initial concentration, so the first element in that array. Now if we plot x versus y, y, run that, we get this line, it gets noisy at the bottom because you know we get so low on uh, concentration that the noise just ends up showing up. So nevertheless, I mean typically you would plot just up until noise became unmanageable, but we're, we're just going to fit to the whole thing. So I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, P equals lin fit x comma y comma first order polynomial and four. oh, no, not n lin fit. I'm thinking of something else. Poly fit. Okay, there we go. So now we end up with this fit constant. 
and that does not look like our true rate constant, right? Which was 1.5. So if I come down here and say P1, we know it should be negative that, the rate constant should be negative that. But remember, this is a pseudo first order rate constant. This is basically the rate constant times the constant concentration of B, which is 0 0.05. So I've got to take P1 divided by the initial concentration and pretty much the constant concentration of B. And I get 1.52, which pretty close. That's about what you could expect as as being near the actual rate constant of k equals 1.5. Now, when you look at this code, you'll see there's a lot more to it than that. There's a lot more plots. There is a much more that you can do. So you're probably going to take this code and run it. It's going to show you the calculated molar ext extinction coefficients for the two different, three different methods. You can see that it's just about always better when you do a nonlinear fit. And it'll show you the calculated rate constant versus the true rate constant. And it'll give you plots. So these are basically the plots that I've already showed you, but just a little bit more fancy and in depth so you can get used to making those. So again, if there's any problems, please let me know.